Welcome, Welcome to the Josh Hall Web Design Show. Web Design Show, helping you build better websites and create a web design business that gives you freedom and a lifestyle you love. Hey, everybody! Welcome in. This is episode eighty-eight, and in this one, we're going to be talking about a very special topic. And I brought in a very special guest to go through this because we're going to be talking about some lessons learned and important takeaways from building a big e-commerce site. And I've brought in one of my web design students. This is Alexis Myers. She is a web design freelancer, and she's early in her journey. And what was really interesting about her start was she used to do web design years ago, long before, uh, I think she was using WordPress, but different themes and stuff. And then she was actually driving Uber at the time of uh, COVID hitting in the pandemic, just you know, changing that industry dramatically. And so when that happened, she pivoted back into web design, started learning it. She actually went through all of my web design courses. So I've been able to, to kind of coach her and mentor her through the beginning of her journey. And then as you'll find out, her first website was not only a big website, but it was a big e-commerce website. And on top of that, the client that she works with, as you'll find out in this episode, was a good person and a good client in a lot of respects, but she was not so tech savvy and was a difficult client in some areas, which particularly for, for clients who aren't tech savvy, you as web designers know that makes things very interesting and very complicated. So Alexis dishes out some absolute gold in this talk. She is really transparent and real with what she learned in this project. And we go over a variety of lessons learned throughout every stage of the project from uh, doing a proposal for an e-commerce project to getting it started, content collection, to implementing all the functionality, to offboarding the site, doing the emails, and a lot of different things that I think you're going to really be able to pull from and learn from Alexis's experience. That way you can apply it to your business right now. And for those of you who are already building online stores, whether it's with WooCommerce or not. So Alexis and I, we both use Divi and WooCommerce, although there's some other solutions out there too. Either way, this talk really isn't specific to WooCommerce. It's more about e-commerce in general, but you're going to have so many takeaways. I, w- I would encourage you to make sure you apply all of these to your business right now for those of you who are already actively building e-commerce stores for your for your clients. And there's no better time to do that, by the way, than right now. Early in 2021, a lot of businesses are still pivoting from COVID and a lot of businesses are getting their products and services online. So there's such a need for, for e-commerce. And on that note, if you are interested in learning Divi and WooCommerce and you want to learn how to build online stores, I would love to help you with that, just like I helped Alexis, as you'll hear. And we can do that through my Divi WooCommerce Beginners course. This course will show you everything you need to know for building online stores quick and efficiently. There's no fluff. It's everything that is most important to know. That way you can feel confident and you can get going and start building online stores for your clients. And I would love to help you uh, with building online stores because again, the need is greater than ever. So without further ado, I want to welcome in Alexis. And again, this is a lessons learned. There are some painful lessons here. There's going to be a lot of lessons you've probably uh, gone through yourself and you'll probably resonate with. But again, I encourage you to really listen through this. Check out the show notes for this episode, joshhall.co slash 088, because you can basically take this and make this a checklist for all of your WooCommerce projects. Uh, but you're going to get a lot out of this and I'm stoked for you to, to see what Alexis learned. So without further ado, let's dive in. Alexis, welcome to the podcast. It's so great to have you on, my dear. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for having me. So I've been coaching you for, I think at this point, over a year now since you just, or maybe just under a year since you just kind of transitioned into web design. And you went through it. You went through your first project (laughs) was a massive e-commerce build with a client that was not a difficult person, it sounded like, but it was a difficult client service, you know, type of relationship and project, but you got through it and it was really cool to see what you learned. And so I wanted to bring you on the podcast to share what you learned about building this e-commerce uh, experience and, and just everything that you learned, the ins and outs of it. So I'm super pumped to dive into that. Uh, before we get into it though, I'd love to hear and to have you share with everyone where you are and what you do with your web design business. So I'm in Washington, DC and I just 
launched my business this year after pivoting because of COVID. <laughs> and um, although I was thinking about it um, and kind of planning for it before that, I, it really made me take the leap, you know, this year. So basically now I'm just doing web design and I'm also just launched my website maintenance plan and SEO services. So that's what I do for entrepreneurs and small businesses. Awesome. Yeah. And we're recording this in January, 2021. So I think you officially started in uh, what, late summer of 2020, I think is when you officially launched. Yeah, I officially launched. And it's funny because right as I was setting myself up and getting ready to launch myself at the, like the end of August, beginning of September is when the e-commerce client reached out to me before I could even launch myself. So yeah. That's right. Because I did you have your website up officially at that point? Um, I had just gotten it up, but I hadn't shared it with anybody yet. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I had just finished it. So I was so happy when she she asked me for it after our call, which is so funny, mm. because I know her from the past. So she had actually reached out to my mom and my mom told her, Oh, my daughter's launching her website business. So she just contacted me from that. And then after our call, she was like, oh, what's your website? And so I was so happy that I had just finished it. I was able to send it to her. like <laughs> Just in time. Yeah, because yeah. there's nothing worse than being like, oh, well, I do websites, but I don't actually have a website right, ready yet. Right. <laughs> yeah. So there, there's lesson number one, everybody. At least get something up, even if yeah. it's just a landing page or just some basic information. Yeah, get it up. I, but that was my first question for you, Alexis, was how you got that client. So yeah. Yeah, so it came it through a, it came through your personal network, right? Through your, exactly. it was a mom, your mom's friend, is that right? Exactly. Yeah, we actually both used to go to church with her like 20 years ago, which is crazy to say, but it was like really crazy. Um, we I, I haven't talked to her or seen her in literally that long, if not longer. And so we're all connected on Facebook or whatever. Um, but she just started, and it was so weird. She sent like one of those emails that you forward people, you know, mm. like, you know, the special, nice little messages that they, you know, that you just kind of forward to people. She just sent one of those to my mother. And my mother was like, I never respond to these, but I just decided to respond to her to this day. And then they just started up a conversation. And it just so happened that she needed a website and she knew that I was launching my business. So it was just kind of really synchronistic, you know, how it happened. Well, that's great. And that's the best place to start. I think, as you know, that's kind of what I preach to everybody is, yeah, there's a lot of different ways to get clients, but the most cost effective and the biggest ROI is just to start with your personal network. And you that's never true. know who your family knows or who, that's true. you know, you may have known in the past, but maybe now they have a business or they know somebody who has a business. So that is definitely the best place to start. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So, it was great. So you list, you gave me some, some things to do uh, differently that I want to get to, but I think a better place to start would be to talk about some of the challenges of this project. Uh, I don't want to, I hate to start on what, maybe it's best to start on a, a, a low note and then we'll end on the high note with what you've learned and what, what to do differently. But yeah, let's start off with some of those challenges because I think we'll all resonate with this. And I know that this is more important than ever for people to get comfortable with knowing how to not only build e-commerce sites, for their clients, but how to like plan them and propose do the proposal because there's a lot of ins and outs with e-commerce that need to be planned out. So let's talk about that. How did you so so you hadn't even done a small business site or anything up to this point? So um, how did you do the proposal? I, I know a little bit about this, but I'm gonna play devil's advocate and just ask you know because <laughs> I think a lot of people are probably curious. Not many people have their first website project be a massive e-commerce site. So what did that look like for you, Alexis, when you started doing the proposal? Okay, so to clarify, I had done websites for people before in the past. Okay. It just wasn't, first of all, never an e-commerce site like this ever. Like I've probably set up one small shopping cart 10 years ago or something, you know, like, um, but so I had done websites for people in the past, but never at this level. I've, I've upgraded my skills since then. So this was my first project with these updated skills and getting back in the game because I was away from it for a while. So I was a little rusty. <laughs> and then and, I, I and updated you were using, my skills. You were using different tools back then, right? Yeah. Really? I mean, I did use, uh, well, yeah, when I first started, I, I was using thesis <laughs> Word for WordPress, you know? Mm. So yeah. So I wasn't yeah, like before Divi came out, I was using thesis. So yeah, I, I definitely updated, upgraded my skills. Plus I had taken a significant time off. So 
this was my first big website, my first like official client, you know, and then also my first big e-commerce. I had never done an e-commerce of this size. So as far as the proposal went, um, so although I knew her, I didn't know what her budget was or what she was expecting or anything. So I kind of wanted to send her my potential client page just so that she could get a feel of the fact, because she had told me that she had over a hundred products. And so mm -hmm. that was like, what, you know? <laughs> and so I wanted her to kind of see my range of pricing so that she could tell that she was like, she fell in the large site, you know, bracket. And so I sent her that page and for some, I, she probably skimmed it. Her response seemed like she skimmed it. She didn't really follow the directions, which is something to pay attention to in the mm -hmm. beginning. You know, she didn't really follow the directions in the beginning about filling out the questionnaire so that I could actually do the proposal for her. I think she felt like the fact that we had the call was enough and she didn't really give me the specifics with the questionnaire. So she was like, Oh, okay, well I'll pick the small site. Cause I have like small, medium, large. <laughs> so she, she was like, I'll start with the small site. So I was like, well, actually we can't really start with the small site because you actually have a large site with the number of products that you have. So and all e-commerce projects are large sites, exactly. even if there's one product. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> because and of yet, all of the stuff that you have to do for the e-commerce. Yes. That's true. And just for everyone's reference, uh, Alexis, what you're talking about, the potential client page is something that I promote and show in my web design business course because you went through yes. that. Thank yes. goodness you did right before you got this project, I feel like, because oh my God. Lord, Lord knows what would have happened if you just kind of went for it. But Oh my uh, God, I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> that, really? uh, just for reference, though, that page is, is what I recommend that most people have as kind of a weed out type of page and not necessarily weed out, but just... It's, it's hidden from the menu, but it's on your site and it will just show price ranges that start at a certain amount just to give people some reference point that way you don't kill too much time, you know, yeah. talk, calling or being on the phone with a lot of clients and then wasting a lot of time if they only are only going to spend 300 bucks. So exactly. Uh, yeah. And in her case, you know, the fact that she, she's, she works in the health field, she's, you know, um, I guess you would say senior adult. I don't know what the proper term is, you know, like mature, mature, whatever you want to call it. Tec but, technically mature. Is yeah, that, yeah. Yeah. Like <laughs> yeah. <that. laughs> so, you know, she works in the health field. She, she makes jewelry on the side. She's not very tech savvy or, you know, online business savvy or launching a business savvy. So I didn't want to sticker shock her either. I wanted her to understand what was involved and why and how much it was going to cost and all of that. So when she had said the small site, it kind of freaked me out because I'm like, how do I jump her from that to what it's really going to cost? And so it was just kind of, again, synchronicity happened where I, I posted in the Facebook group to, you know, to ask like, how do I do this? You know, because I need to bring her up, but I'm scared and I don't know how to let her know that this is going to cost way more than what she thinks it's going to cost or whatever. So you came in right in the clutch where like, literally I was getting ready to respond to her and and you were like, I wouldn't do it lower for lower than this, you know, and I'm just like, thank God, because, I, you know, I couldn't bring myself to come up with 3500, but I did at least yeah. 3000. So I was, yeah, I was gonna say, I think I think you were gonna charge 1500. <laughs> but then I said, I would not do this for less than 35. And then right. you, you, you bumped it up to the 3k, which yeah, hey, that's not bad for the first project. Yeah, you learned <laughs> a lot. You know, I mean, I'm sure, you know, it, Probably not the best example to calculate an hourly on, but you learned a lot and thank goodness that, uh, yeah, you, you would have been paying her if it was at the 1500 range. Oh my God. And, <laughs> yeah, right. And, you know, like it paid, it paid itself so many, it, it paid for itself so many ways because, you know, not only, first of all, I had never, ever, ever charged that much for a website ever, ever in my life. Like all of the websites that I did, I'm sure I was undercharging when I was doing websites way back in the day, but I had never charged that much. Plus she paid me multiple bonuses after the project. Well, not after the project was over, but after our uh, original deadline, because she just saw the value in what I was doing and all of the work that I was doing. I think that she was not aware of how much it took and how much time it took and how much work I was going to be doing. And once she saw that and she was so pleased with the result of how the site looked, 
she just paid me multiple times, like multiple bonuses afterwards because she really valued it. So that yeah. made a difference, you know? That's a, yeah, that's a huge thing. And that's where, like I mentioned, it wasn't that she herself was a difficult client. Right. It was just the, difficult the circumstances. Situation. Yeah, yes. yeah. Being that she wasn't, she wasn't tech savvy, you knew there was going to be a lot of content collection. There was a lot of things that you were, you know, pretty vigilant about to prepare for, but I'm sure a lot of stuff still caught you by surprise. So like going back yeah. to the proposal, um, right. what were some of the, what were some of the challenges that happened when you were doing the proposal? Did you have a hard time figuring out like how many products and variations there were going to be? Or do you, do you feel like you, you did the deliverables okay enough to get going or what did that look like as far I as did. the actual proposal? Um, as far as the proposal, the, one of the struggles was because she didn't actually fill out the specifics of the, the, the form, the questionnaire, um, I was guessing on if she needed the, if she was going to need me to set up like an email marketing for her. Because a lot of times, you know, like e-commerce stores do like, you know, sign up to my email list and get 10% off or something like that. So I didn't know if she was planning on doing that. And mm -hmm. then it was other stuff. Like I did know that I was going to be setting up the shipping for her. I didn't know how extensive that was going to be until I got into it. But, um, so that was already on, itemized. I did, I used your actually one of your other podcasts for about e-commerce and the, the itemized list that you gave in that podcast i think you did it back in april of 2020 so that i used I like literally i used that in the last minute before i responded to her oh, to beautiful. put the the proposal together and i put a lot I, I just kind of you know edited it for my specific um you know situation but i used that to as you know my my basis for sending her the proposal it was some things that i was still guessing on because i wasn't exactly sure for her specific situation, but that was incredibly helpful. Awesome, yeah, and that was episode 32 for everyone's reference, which is 10 tips for quoting an e-commerce project. I'm so glad, yeah. I mean, that episode was meant for you, Alexis, because oh my that, God. <laughs> that must've come just in time, yeah, because there are a number of things, and I think one worthwhile thing to talk about here is that with an e-commerce project, it, there are so many more components to it than a regular website. There is, like you mentioned, a CRM integration, which would be like a MailChimp or Constant Contact or something where when somebody makes an order, where does their information go? Where does the, the details go for that customer? There's add-ons, there's additional you know integrations that you might need for the website, depending on the functionality. And there's the shipping, tax settings, taxes. all those things. Yeah, yeah, taxes. A lot of that needs to be talked about before right. moving forward because that can add, you know, several hours to a project or more, depending Definitely. on that. And, uh, and speaking of that, one of my main things that I was, to, I would say for people, you know, get a statement, I would say not only have an e-commerce specific questionnaire for the proposal, but even after they get in the door, when it's the website strategy questionnaire time, have an e-commerce website strategy questionnaire with specific questions for that project because having a box of what is your, what is your shipping statement? Like even if we had had a basic conversation on what her shipping was going to be, right? She, you know, she told me she had, we did have a basic conversation about she was only shipping to these places or whatever, right? But there's still going to be, especially for e-commerce sites, a specific page that you put on your e-commerce site that says what the shipping situations are, what the return situations are. So it's good to, that's part of the content collection process too, is having that specific process of collecting these specific statements so that not only you know what to do up front, and I had to have multiple conversations with her throughout the process to finally get the the result of this is what happens this is what happens and this is what i need to put in the settings but also this is what needs to be put on the page and displayed mm. on the site for anyone that needs to know you know the that extra information so yeah there is a lot more with even just uh, even if you're selling one product there's a lot more that you have to put on there as far as your terms and the privacy and everything else so there's yeah. all those additional components that need to be factored in in this proposal process and then of course That's true. The biggest thing, which you found out that we talked about, is the products themselves. And more importantly, how many variations of those products? Because that's where 
e-commerce projects can get out of hand because a client might think, well, I only have 10 products, but if each one of those products have five different variations, you actually have 50 products because right. each Special. one of those, if there's one t-shirt that has a small, medium, and large and comes in three different colors, that's nine products right there, technically, because each one is its own SKU number. Each one of those could be out of stock. So that's one thing that's really important to to guide clients through. And I think you said it best, Alexis, most clients just don't understand how much yes. work goes into it. And this, this is true for all websites. So it's our job as web designers not to get frustrated and angry at clients, but to just educate them and let them know, I know it seems simple. I know you're probably seeing commercials for these do-it-yourself $1 <laughs> websites, but I'm telling you, it isn't that easy if you're going right. to do it right. And right. You, unless you purchase some pre-built system that you're going to have no control over, this is this. it takes a lot more than that. So um, that that's a big thing. Those are all things that are hugely important for the proposal process. So I'm so I'm so glad those resources helped you out just in time. I know it wasn't perfect and you've got some things to do differently that we'll get to here, but I'd love to transition to the next aspect, which is starting the project and the content collection. So what were some of the challenges with that? Because you had a lot of different projects or a lot of different products. This client, again, she was a nice person, great client, but she wasn't tech savvy, which adds like, that's a hidden line item in a proposal right there. You're not tech savvy. You're, we're gonna, you're gonna need to be charged for that, even though it's not gonna be like you know non tech savvy person in the in the right. line item. But um, but what did that yeah. look like? What were some of those challenges for you? Oh my gosh! So first of all, I you know I was almost not sticker shock, but just in shock by the level of not knowing Dropbox, just like or or <clears throat> not well. Okay. Let me just say this. Not obviously everybody is not familiar with Dropbox, so that's fine. And and that's where I would say, you know, create a video to show people what to do in Dropbox. What it is what to I, I gave written instructions. I did create several videos to show them other aspects of the process, but just not Dropbox for whatever reason. So I that mm -hmm. was I guess a mistake on my end. But um yeah, definitely show them what to do in Dropbox and show them what you mean by um, your, the organization that you need with the folders. Like I, I assumed that writing out what I needed was enough, but it wasn't. And okay. I'll put, I think I put more on her and writing the def and writing out the instructions than I should have, because I was unaware of her level of tech savviness at the beginning. You know, I, you know, cause sometimes it goes, it goes from tech savviness with the internet versus tech savviness with just basic computer knowledge sometimes. And I think I yeah. assumed, you know, um, so yeah. So just, just as far as like just getting her to get, give me things in an organized way so that I could then put them in a site. And I would say, and you've said this too in your trainings and, and, and other podcasts about telling them why you need it the way you need it because that helps open up their mind to, okay, she's not just being anal. This is why she needs this. I need to help her do this for me, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, you know, so that, that helped once I was finally able to, I guess, explain it in a way that she could understand of, you know, why I need the specific organization. I need things labeled. I need things separated. I, you can't just put, all of your product images in one folder like that's not gonna work you know like yeah. i need it labeled i need it separated i need it separated by category i need it separated by you know the name of it and the number because again we did like to date it's about 125 products you know in the site right now so it's just like you know if it's that many products i need them numbered i need them labeled i need and that was that's the other thing that i actually got from another one of your podcasts that came right on time in i think october or november um the content collection one with the content snare guy oh, i didn't yeah, do James, content yeah. snare yes i didn't do content snare but when he was just saying tell them exactly what you need as far as like what well, i i created a video and in that video i created a word document that just said product name product description product price you know and then okay. and once i did that because he was like you know tell them exactly what you need you know don't just let them come up with it or whatever because they get lost and so that's true and once I created those bullet points of product name product description product price 
she was able to beautiful you know do it very easily so that and that's the biggest thing to get over because you probably felt like a little bit of a jerk i imagine when you put all that (laughs) together but you realize it's for the good of everybody involved because if you just say give me content that can be a nightmare just for a five-page brochure website let alone an e-commerce project with hundreds of products like it absolutely, particularly in this case, it's got to be structured and organized, and you probably will have to customize it a little bit for every client, at least for e-commerce projects. So I would say you're absolutely right, Alexis. Like, create some videos or some basic tr- walkthroughs on how you know you should get files through Dropbox or whatever that can be given to any client. But when it comes to e-commerce, you might have to say like, okay, if we're going to have different categories, you know, you might have to list out, okay, mark these categories this way, or, you know, these products this way, that way, you know, because it's the only way to do it effectively. And yeah, you referenced the episode I did with James Rose from Content Snare. That's episode 57 for anyone who wants to revisit that. And I'll make sure these are all linked in the show notes. Um, But yeah, content collection is... One of the trickiest, if not the trickiest parts, I think, in e-commerce because of the amount of variations. And and like I said, even there was one site I did a few years back. I remember it was only one product, but they had a lot of different variations. So it was it was still tricky then, too. Like it sounded like, you know, one product shouldn't be a big deal, but it actually was pretty tricky. Now, luckily, that client was fairly tech savvy, so I really didn't need to guide him too much. He was already in he was from the military, so he was already organized. I love working with military people because they're typically, they just have a mind for organization. Um, But in that case, like your case, yeah, sometimes you don't know how they're going to send stuff. Like, was she just sending you stuff in one folder and you had to kind of tell her, is that how that went? Yeah. Yeah. Multiple times she would just put multiple, um, you know, pictures in, in, a folder. And I can't even remember right now from the beginning about what she did with the document. It was like, I think that in, in one video, cause I had to create like two videos for her <laughs> to get through the, the, the content and the organization of it. But, um, one of them, I said, put as many pictures as you want in this folder, but I meant of that one product, like, cause she uh. had mentioned that she might take multiple pictures of each piece and I could choose which was the best picture, which is obviously great. but. <laughs> I think that I didn't specify it or I said it, but then I said that too. And then I think yeah. she just ran with the second thing I said or something. I don't know. But then so, you get like, then with a hundred products, then you're looking at three or 400 pictures and deciding yeah. which one. Yeah. So it's like, I don't know. And I told her, I was like, I don't know what, where these product, where these pictures go. Like I can't, I can't, you know, put, put these products on the site. I need the picture and the product information together in one place labeled, Yes. You know, so that I can understand where to go and what to do. And then the second part of that is as we start uploading pictures or uh, uploading products to the site, it's like, um, then the, the organization changes where I, tra- I, you know, like I had to, I had to create another folder of, okay, these are the products that have been added now only put you know, the new products in this folder. So oh, okay. that was a new level of, of organization so that I'm like, I don't have to count, you know, so that, yeah. I, <laughs> you know, I know what I've added and this is new and it just makes it and it's, flow smoother. It's tricky too. One thing that needs to be accounted for in the proposal process for e-commerce sites is if you do have a savvy client, often what you can do is get the template set up and get a few products and categories set up, and then you can train them on how to add the products and manage some of that. Um, But in your case, it doesn't sound like she was probably on the site. So you're doing every one. I I asked her and she said, I want you to do it because you keep it consistent. I want you to do it. So I said, okay. So we talked about, you know, ongoing doing that, me doing it. And that was fine. I did though train her on how to complete the orders because you know with the shipping yes. yeah. you know after she's shipped it then she has to go in and mark it complete so i did train her on that but and she she did it. she called me when she did it for the first time she was like you'll be so proud of me i did this oh so. that's cool <laughs> yeah that's yeah. cool yeah i was i was gonna ask about client training it might be a good chance to talk about that like did you find out from the outset what she wanted or what she needed to do on the site versus what you were expected to do? Because that makes a big impact on the development, but then also, like you said, ongoing. 
That's true. In the beginning, no. But one of our first um, conversations on Zoom, um, because most of the time we, we communicated in base camp, but one, we did schedule a few Zoom calls and um, I asked her, you know, do you want me to, I was like, I can train you. I can create detailed videos on how you can continue to upload products or do you want me to do it? She was like, I'd rather you do it. I was like, okay, well, we can work out, you know, a monthly payment or just, you know, um, invoice whenever you want me to do them. So that's, that's been working so far. So Beautiful. Now, the one, one thing I meant to ask and mention real quick, because I think, if I remember right, I think you asked me about this and that was the images themselves. Like you were getting images that were really wide and horizontal versus some that were vertical. <laughs> and yeah. that... That can be very tricky. So I think it's really important for everyone to remember to specify ideally image sizes. Be remembering most clients are not going to know about image types or image sizes. So they're probably just going to upload a bunch of big photos that could be all different shapes and sizes. Right. So if you're going to redo those and put them in Photoshop or some sort of uh, image cropping tool, or Im image optimizing tool, you need to charge for that, or that's got to be accounted for. So that's another biggie. That's that's important to relay to clients is the actual product images. Like who's going to manage those? We need yeah. to make sure we get those because you had that problem, right? They were all different shapes. And yeah. Sizes. So that was definitely one of my things. Like we're already going through my list, so you know, <laughs> we're, we'll, we're rec we'll, re we'll recap we're the list at the it. end. How, how's that sound? We'll yeah, recap yeah, it. Yeah, no, that's end. perfect. But. Um, yeah, I would say have, ask the question up front. And again, that goes to the proposal questionnaire for e-commerce. You know, are they planning on having a professional, you know, professional photos done of their products? I would recommend that. But asking up front so that you know what you're dealing with is important because she thought uh, she was adamant about taking her own pictures of her products, which is fine. But she thought that she should zoom in on the pictures or crop them she was zooming in and when she was taking the pictures like taking them really close but then she was also cropping them before sending them to me oh so okay. that left me no control to be able to uh make cr make them consistent in the site where i could crop them a certain way and make sure that they show well in the thumbnail and show well on the site, you know, so that wasn't working well. And they were still large size and I did have to resize them. I was using that. I learned that I use GIMP, which is like a free version of Photoshop. I use that and I, um, even though I was resizing them initially in GIMP, I started using that imageresizer.org that you talk, talk about. And that one, when you resize it there, it makes it even smaller. The size of it's the, a great tool, isn't it? It's amazing. Yeah. It really yeah. is optimizing. Image, yeah, yeah. Image, so I started. Was... I would crop them in my in GIMP, and then I would resize them in uh, and just make all of them one thousand width. Perfect. And the the length was different. I mean the the yeah width and height. The height was mm -hmm. different, but the, I made them all one thousand in width and and it dramatically decreased the size of the photos way more than if I did the exact same thing in GIMP. So Perfect. I would highly recommend that image resizer. That's really, really good for optimizing for the website. Yeah, it's a free tool too, imageresizer.com. Exactly. I'll link that in the show notes as well. And actually, um, that's what I told my clients to use. I what what's cool about that tool is it's been out there for years. I don't I don't I don't remember how I stumbled across it because I I knew clients were not going to use Photoshop and they weren't going to do anything fancy. So I wanted to find something that was fairly user friendly. And yeah, imageresizer.com. It's what I told clients to use for just that. Or yeah. if they're not going to use it, somebody on their team or even designers can use it. So yeah, that's a, yeah. That's a good resource because that's but, another another aspect that can cause a lot of issues. I know definitely. Uh, through the end of 2019 and the end of 2020, we were working on a huge e-commerce project and we experienced the same issues. We were getting images all different shapes and sizes and we were spending a lot of time uh, you know, tweaking those and it became a really issue, a big yeah. issue and it made me realize that's something that needs to be talked about from the outside. And sure. charged for, that's a really good point. It, yeah. That's what, what takes the time and that's what, what you're paying for, you know, that makes how, sense. How did she, so you mentioned that she went above and beyond for you 
you know, pay, paying a little extra because she realized you were going above and beyond for her. How did she realize that? Did you just, were you upfront about so, this is taking longer than expected or this is, did you tell her like, this is actually a little out of scope from what we talked about? Like, I, I know you didn't necessarily charge her more, but how did that work? No, I think that as we started to, to fall into more and more issues with things that she noticed that I was like just helping a lot with, like for instance, with the, with the Dropbox, you know, that took a few weeks, a couple of, a couple of weeks to, to finally get that straight. Then PayPal became an issue. Mm. Um, she told me before we signed up together that um, she needed my help setting up her bi- PayPal business account. So I, t- and I put that in the itemized list of the p- proposal. And so I said, that's fine. Um, I can help you with that. But I didn't really know what she needed. Well, come to find out, so I signed up with PayPal many, many years ago. Um, okay, like 10 years ago. And and so they, they require different things now. I don't know if they require yeah. different things for e-commerce or what, but they require you to verify yourself in multiple ways when you do a, a business account, which I was not aware of. Mm. And so she had trouble verifying herself. So I kind of had to walk her through understanding what they were asking for, taking the picture of her license correctly. Like I really got involved with more than I should have, (laughs) but I'm like, she needs to be able to accept payments. Like, you know what I'm saying? And I tried to get her signed up for Stripe, but they don't accept people in the Virgin Islands. She's in the Virgin Islands. Um, Oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah. They only do Puerto Rico for us territories for whatever Mm -hmm. reason. And so, um, I couldn't get her on Stripe and PayPal was taking her through all of this. So I had to work. We worked many days over that. And it was just like one tech thing after another where she realized she's leaning on me for a lot of help and guidance, asking me a lot of questions. And I was like, you know, and then when she saw the website as well, she was like, you know, she said to me, you should have charged me more. She said that, <laughs> you know, she was like, you should have charged me more. And I was like, okay, you know, so yeah. I just, she was like, charge me, you know? And so then I just came up with the invoice to charge her after she had already paid the final payment, you know? So, and then she sent me another bonus without even asking or whatever. So, you know, it was surprising, but it was very great. I was very grateful for it because I think she just kind of started to see you know, and plus I think too, some, a lot of the questions that I had to circle back and ask her to say, okay, I really need to get this solidified. Um, you know, we need to work together on this again, like maybe with the shipping statement. And when I say shipping statement, I mean, outside of the terms and conditions and privacy policy, I mean, a specific okay. yeah. page that is live on the site that visitors can see when they need extra information when they're buying mm. stuff from her. Um, because she only, you know, ships to certain places. So they need to see that outside of the term. I don't think people really read the terms and conditions, you know, but like a, a shipping, <laughs> no. a shipping page, you know, for yeah, shipping or information. Shipping zone or something. Yeah. Yeah. I, I found when I was doing my own research on other jewelry, jewelry stores, uh, online jewelry stores, they had a shipping page, you know, like a page that, that any customer could see. So that's what I meant by that. But anyway, gotcha. um, yeah, so she would, I, no, I think that she noticed all of the different things that we, we had to work on together to finally come up with the, the end result, And then all of the extra, t- the tech things that she kind of needed help with that I just kind of jumped in and helped her with just to make sure, cause I'm like, you know, it, it needs to be done. It's an essential part. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. Well, and you did really good. I'm still very proud of you with how you handled that because a lot of web designers probably would have got really bitter or frustrated or started disappearing or wouldn't communicate, <laughs> but you did like to your credit, you really stuck in there and you communicate with her. And I remember you kind of asking me throughout the whole process and just being vocal about your frustrations. And I tried to give you as much advice as I could through that period. And then I remember, but I remember what was cool was you saying like, you know, she loves the site and she's so excited and she's offering me more like that. That's the beauty about this type of situation is, is even if you come through challenges and struggles, if you just take the high road and explain things in detail and if it's out of scope, say it's out of scope and that you can just say there's other options to do this or in your case just you know be as helpful as you can that will really go a long way because now she's on your maintenance plan and you've made yourself a client for life with her and I know she's loving the site um but actually before we get to how you wrap the site up and how you know she was super happy with it uh what were some of the some of the other on-site 
struggles because we talked a little bit about the shipping and tax. Those were a little more complicated. The payment yeah. gateway, that stuff is the, the common things with e-commerce sites. But was there anything else that was tricky when you were actually designing the site itself? Because um, I know a lot of times what's interesting with e-commerce projects is clients are so focused on products they either just don't care about the rest of the website, which is kind of cool because you can just design the rest of the website, or sometimes they're focused on the website, you know, design. And some of that stuff isn't as important for them as the product and, and the content. Did you have, did you have kind of a struggle with any of that as far as like where her focus was during that period of, of the actual site? Oh, design? No. So that's another way she's a good client is that she really leaned on me for my expertise with design decisions. She was like, whatever you think is good, I'm with, because she was impressed. Like, a, you know, I did the initial design, again, from your web design course, uh, business course. You know, I, I presented her with the initial design, which was the homepage. But actually, my initial design included a little bit more than that because she needed to see the products, you know. Yeah. And so I had yeah. a couple of category pages as well. But um, she she was so impressed with that, that everything else from that point on, she was like, you know, uh, whatever you think you know, we're, I'm good. She didn't care. Oh, that's you know? awesome. Did yeah, you do it? Yeah. Did you do a video for the presenting this? Yeah. 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 Uh huh. Beautiful. That's yeah, it. You, that it. your, your example right there is exactly, that is the power of just getting the front page and a couple main pages in the case of yeah. e-commerce, like a couple product pages together. Yeah. And yeah, if you do a video, it. it will like, how much time did that save you as opposed to just sending a link over because exactly. she trusts you. She she understood why you did this. And if she yeah. likes it, maybe there was a few edits here or there, but then you automatically kind of have the high ground and it's going to save you so much time. I'm so glad that worked out for you, Alexis. Oh That's yeah. Awesome. She loved it. She loved the video, the walkthrough of everything. And I told her in the video, you know, give me an itemized list of any changes or feedback or whatever. And she did that. So that worked out well. So yeah, she, that was great. She loved it. That, that actually was really, really, really good. Um, as far as like design things I did, you know, have a couple of just uh, two that I could think of is one with the CSS. So, oh my gosh, I'm so glad that you told me to do CSS, you know, for change, you know, design things instead of doing it one by one with Divi. You know, mm. if you can explain that if you want to, as far as like, you know. Yeah. So what, yeah. And this, I, I talk about this in my Woo, my Divi WooCommerce course. And that is the Divi builder has WooCommerce, like you can build WooCommerce products with the builder now. The only problem with that is if you have a lot of products, it's going to be very tough to manage things globally. So you can set like IDs and classes and styles to bl certain blocks, but it's just a lot easier just to use the standard WooCommerce product page and not use the Divi Builder. So I always recommend to everybody, if you're going to do a, an e-commerce site with, with Divi and WooCommerce, only do the Builder, the Divi Builder, if you only have a few products. And I use the Divi Builder for my site for my course pages, but... I don't have that many courses. Like if I had a hundred courses, it would be a whole nother ball game. So right. in your case, Alexis, yeah, just using the standard WooCommerce WordPress page options, not worrying about the Divi Builder in with the actual products is key because then if she says, you know what, actually I want the titles to be like a dark blue, it's unless you have a, a global style on the builder, it's going to be a pain to to do that for a hundred and some products. So right. I'm yeah. super so, glad you went that route. You know? Yeah, that I see. After, as I started to go through, I was like, I see now why this was a good route to go because I could not imagine redoing that many, you know, again. and I had to redo multiple things in the beginning too. In the beginning, I had about 30 products that I did before we did more. And there were multiple things I had to go back and redo, like mm. the shipping class. I, I did all the other shipping stuff, but the shipping class, you actually have to go into to the product to change you know, each product or each category of products has a different shipping class or whatever. So I had to go back and do that. I had to go back and do the stock. I don't know why I forgot to do the stock when I was first doing it. So anyway, I had to, well, <laughs> I had it's, not to like, it's not like you had much going on. I don't know how you <laughs> forgot about that little detail. <laughs> right, right. Look, it was, this was total newbie stuff that I was doing. Okay. You know, but, um, but the, the, the one thing though, with the CSS was, um, I had to, so I noticed that sometimes the styling would just disappear and it would go back to basic 
and I'm like, what happened? Mm -hmm. And so I would go into the CSS, the custom CSS section of Divi and just go in there and then hit public and just like make a space, like do no changes. Like maybe just put, hit the space bar, do no changes and hit publish and then go back and everything went back to normal. So that, that was happening. It was like a little glitch happening where for whatever reason, all of the CSS styling that I did would just go away. And then I would have to just go in and do no changes, just kind of maybe refresh the CSS area in the customizer. Mm. Um, and then it would go back. So that, that was an issue. And then the other thing that I ran into was the emails, the order confirmation emails. Um, you know, I wasn't that was the next thing I was going to ask about was like getting, <laughs> you know, getting through content collection and the site design, right. but now comes the, the final aspects function. of function and, yeah. and the biggest one is email. So yeah, let's just dive into it. Let's, let's talk about the the most fun aspect of the project, <laughs> email delivery. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it was like, um, cause obviously I was testing it out as a customer. And so I, I paid for one just as a customer, you know, and then I, um, as a test customer, obviously. And then I did a few after that, just giving myself a coupon code so to make it free, just that I wasn't, you know, going through that cycle every time. And the, the store owner never got their order, order confirmations. And the, um, the customer wasn't getting order confirmations. And so I, after many, many different troubleshooting uh, activities, I figured out that the SMTP, I think it's called WP SMTP plugin, mm -hmm. um, definitely use that along with SendGrid. And it's really important to put the from name in the SMTP plugin, make the from name an actual name, not the name of the company, not the name and of the domain, but the name of the person who's the owner of the company, because the emails figure out that, oh, this is just a domain or this is just a company. It's not a real person. So it could still go through, but end up in the spam. So if yeah, you don't want it to end up in the spam, put it as the name. Yeah, Not that the, is a come. that is a biggie because like I noticed with Elegant Themes, for example, it's always Nick at Elegant Themes, which is true. The owner. Uh, but I was just thinking like I'm trying to think of like a subscription. So I use I I subscribe to Dollar Shave Club, and okay. uh, so I get like my razors every month and everything. Uh, and I I think it's just like info at Dollar Shave Club or something, but it still comes through. But you know, they're, I'm sure they have like a team of email delivery, delivery people That's for the true. average people. Like it's, it is tough. That gets tricky. If you do info at company name or worse, if you do like company at Gmail or something, you're probably going to hundred percent be in the spam or junk folder. Um, Even with SendGrid and the SMTP plugin in, yeah, it, it, it would start going through, but then it ended up in the spam. So well, a lot, was, depending on the email client that people are using, they're smart enough now to know if something looks promotional or if it's coming from a company. So they'll often just feed those to the marketing tab or junk tab or whatever. So mm -hmm. it is really, really important. And I plan on doing an episode soon. I think I'm actually going to get our boy Ammer back. Um, to talk about email delivery and really dive into the specifics of of some things we can do because it is something that unfortunately there is a little more right and wrong with email delivery, but it does it there's a lot of like little things that you can do differently depending on the site and depending on the type of customers that are getting it. So uh, the basics though are what you just said an S yeah. SMTP plugin like WP SMTP and then SendGrid for sure. That's what me and my agency use to make sure that the emails are actually being delivered from the website to the the customer. And, and you want to make sure, because I've had issues with clients in the past who weren't getting their orders to their email. It was going to junk. So we had to do the same thing because you want to make sure your client's getting notified every time something's going on. So. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. The, the store owner needs to get it and the customer, specifically the customer, they need to see what they ordered, you know? So yeah, that's, that's really important to do. Definitely. Yeah. I would say those are the top three things to do. And I, I was going to ask you too, like, do you think possibly because the site was so new 
that that may have, you know, maybe that the, could, the, that could be, I, I don't know. I can't say for sure, maybe. but it makes sense to me that a new site maybe doesn't have a strong domain authority yet. So right. look, all these platforms and tools are very smart. So they know like, yeah. you know, yeah. something coming from elegant themes versus, you know, a jewelry shop. I forget what your client site is, but yeah. you know, it, it looks a little different. So yeah, absolutely. I, I, I'd have to check to, to I, I don't want to say for sure because I don't know exactly, but that makes sense to me that maybe a site with no or little domain authority is is going to affect email as yeah, well. Yeah, it was so brand new. It was so yeah. brand new. So yeah, but anyway, it, luckily I figured out. Okay, you know yeah. this is these are the things to do now. You know, so I so, would and that was like that was the last hurdle, right? I think that was the last biggie for you as far as I think so pretty much yeah. yeah um i can't really remember much after the emails um i know i did her seo um after that i don't think i got too much um you know yeah i don't think i and got we'll, too much after we'll talk about managing a woocommerce site or e-commerce site in a different episode potentially because that's a whole nother ball game i know you and i are talking about that because you're yeah, a member yeah. of my web design club so we're we're going through that and you've given me some really good things to to think about to to update my maintenance plan course uh with how you know what i've learned with managing woocommerce sites and then what my team is doing and what other people are doing as well because again there's no right or wrong way to do it but you know e-commerce sites have got to be managed so that's definitely something actually I'm, i wanted to ask you about that did you tell her about your maintenance plan and hosting and everything from the outset? Or what did that look like as far as when she knew about the ongoing services you could do for her? Um, it is in my contract. Um, you know, again, from your web design business course, I definitely mentioned it multiple times in the contract under security and maintenance. Um, but after that, I did mention it to her in one of our Zoom calls. I asked her how many products per month she thinks that she would be uploading um, on an ongoing basis because I know she's talked about constantly adding new products. So mm -hmm. in, in that conversation, I mentioned that I have a, a website maintenance plan and that I would send her the information. I had to set it up. So it took me a little while to set it all up um, and then finally send it to her. But I did that and then she got to it. So, but yeah, I did mention it to her in one of our Zoom calls. So it was pretty yeah. casual. Um, and quick. And I did mention a few other times that we would be able, because once I started seeing how that was the other thing, and that's another thing that people might consider, especially if it's a lot of products, you know, I realized that she was behind in sending me products and, you know, mm. she's working her full time. It's a lot of work, you know, and so she was behind in sending me all of the rest of the products, you know, she had them created. She just needed to take the pictures and send the the detail. So maybe finding out ahead of time, pictures are created and details are written already mm -hmm. before the project starts can be good for people to find out in the beginning as well. But she did, she, she started running behind way behind the last date of the, you know, the original uh, launch date of the site. And so I, I asked her multiple times, you know, um, you know, how many, you know, products do you think you'll be adding or, or, you know, I'll give you a way that we can continue working together now that the bulk of the project is done, you know? So yeah, I, I mentioned I think it I, a few times. I think I recommended to you what I generally recommend for everybody in this type of custom situation is you have your maintenance plan and up to an hour of time per month or whatever that would entail. It's a little different for e-commerce because those should be more expensive anyway, because you're doing a lot more month to month. But for a custom situation like this, just for everyone's reference, you can just add an hourly bulk of or hours of retainer every month. And it could be, you know, if she's going to use up to two hours a month on average, then you could have that in place. If she That's wants true. to do it, just, you know, you could just say, you know, normally I charge this much for four hours for a retainer that we can use within 30 days. But for you, I'll cut it down to this much. So it could be kind of a as needed basis or an ongoing, depending on the situation, because in this case, yeah, she's doing a lot ongoing, but a lot of projects, you know, they might have new products every few months, so they don't necessarily need the extra time every month because it right. shouldn't roll over. Um, but that way that you could just have that option for them, that way they don't feel left in the dark after a website goes live. That way exactly. you're managing the site and when they're ready and when they have an influx of products or changes, you can, you know, they can come to you. And since they're on your maintenance plan, they get a discount, they feel special. Exactly. And it's a win-win. It's a win-win. Yeah. 
And it felt really good, honestly, you know, going through your maintenance plan course and then implementing that whole free hour, you know, and telling her and the discounted hourly rate. It felt good to say, hey, let's switch over to this, even though she was she was still sending me the original you know, hundred or whatever from the original project. I'm like, you know, let's switch over to this since it's like two months now after the original date that, that we were supposed to be done with this. Like, let's switch over to this. That way you get this discount, you get this free hour. And it felt good to give her that and make her feel like, you know, and then I, and I explained to her, you know, as you have uh, outside of the free hour, you know, as you have different products to upload, um, I'll give you an invoice. Uh, I'll estimate how many, how much time it, it takes to do it and give you an invoice and make sure to deduct that free hour and we're good to go. And what I'm planning on doing on going, cause we're, we're just like in our first month of that at this point um, is to kind of gauge the pattern of how many products she has a month. And then after that, maybe I'll say, Hey, I noticed that you have 20 products a month. Let's do, let's put that on a automatic kind of a yes, thing, you know, that's, to add that's in. Uh, that's a great way to go, Alexis. Yep. Just, and you can just let clients know, like, let's just test it out. Let's test yeah. the waters for the first couple of months to see, see how much do. is coming in. Exactly. And then, you know, we'll just do it hourly now, but then, you know, what if we figure out that it's always typically a couple hours a month, we'll just, you know, set it up like that. So exactly. that's a great way to go. Yeah. Well, this has been great, Alexis. I feel like yeah. we've covered a, a lot of good ground here as far as where you were starting this project, being that you had some experience with different website tools in the past, but you transitioned to it, you know, to start your business. And this was the biggie, your first big e-commerce project with a lot of content collection. And we talked about your the proposal process and what you learned with that. We talked about the content collection and working with the client and then talk about a lot of the challenges and struggles that most all of us face with the actual functionality and the design and then working with the client revisions and all that. And then the final steps like email deliverability, all that kind of good stuff. Uh, I want to recap just really quick because I have one final question for you, but I want to recap really quick just the stuff you mentioned in the in the document you sent over, which we basically covered, but yeah. Um, I'm just going to read them through real quick just to recap them because these are great for everyone's reference. So things okay. that Alexis recommends asking up front differently is a special info page for content collection where you know, you'd get more details on shipping information, return policy, and all that stuff that's going to be on a separate page from a, 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 a terms or conditions page for sure. Yeah. Um, for initial design, ask for small number of products in all categories. What did you mean by that, Alexis? Do you mean so, that? like in my for my initial design? At first, I told her send me ten products, right? And okay, um, but but really specifically, once I actually started to put the design together, I was like, actually, send me like three products from each category. That way, gotcha. I can give you a better idea of what it's going to look like and what how I really want to put together the front page and all of that. So oh, I see. That's great. Yeah, yeah. That is important too, particularly for that first preview because thumbnails are terrible. Like, you know, mock up placeholder images, clients yeah. just don't get that. So yeah, if you can get, I think we did that too on the big one that we did a couple of years ago. We just had, I, I think we did like maybe 10 or 15 products because they're all in different categories. That way the client could at least see what it's going like to look like. Yeah. We didn't have the product pages all built out. We just put the featured image in. So that way she could see what those pages would look like. Yeah. yeah. And it helped her also see what the category pages were going to look like too. If yeah. I have a little bit of category, a little bit of products on each category page, it helps her see what they're going to look like once they start to get filled up. Yes. Know? Yes. That's great. Yeah. yeah. So that's awesome. Uh, you mentioned recommending professional photos be taken of products. Yes, I can't recommend that enough. Yes. Uh, and then we talked about the cropping and the image sizes yeah. and all that stuff. Ideally, try to have that all set up. And there's no right or wrong image size for WooCommerce, but depending right. on the type of products, it's best to at least set like parameters like you did. And, and talk ideally about have, it up front before yes, the talk proposal. About it yes. And know whether you're going to be updating and editing the images or if they're going to be right. you know, doing that. Right. Uh, talked about ha asking. This is a big thing too, which is easy to overlook. Do they already have PayPal or Stripe set up or are you setting that up? Because yeah. that needs to be accounted for a hundred percent. So that's a great call. And then um, preparing them for the descriptions for, for the products and then any sort of like SEO. Is that kind of what you... Yeah. You know I mean, that? like let them know that there's two description boxes. Do they have 
you know, are they going to have a, a small description and a large description? Do they just want the same one? Do they have the descriptions already ready for each product? Or is it going to take time throughout our product to come up with the descriptions? You know, it's good to just kind of know those things before the project starts. Beautiful. You know? Yeah. Beautiful. So those are some of the things that you, you learned that you would ask differently and just a few yeah. things that you would do differently up front or do differently. Um, maybe a little more documentation or a video on Dropbox and exactly. actually, cause it's, you know, most people can figure out Basecamp and other stuff, but yeah, image collection is, is different with, uh, particularly when it comes to organizing images, yes. that's, that's really tricky. So that's a great idea. You could do some standard stuff and then you might just have to maybe just do a custom loom video. Like maybe you set up some category, maybe you set up the first few categories and show them, you know, here's how we need to do this project. Just continue this this instruction that and, I set up for you. And to that point, I did set up the folders, but I didn't set up the document. So setting uh, up the document and putting those bullet points of exactly what you need is just taking it that extra step further to make sure you get what you need and you don't have to waste too much time with that. You know what I mean? Beautiful. So yeah, okay. I agree. Awesome. And then you talked about uh, shipping classes, you know, getting that set up in the first. beginning. First. Yeah, yeah. When you're doing your first few when you're doing your first few products, make sure to set those up, for, especially when you have uh, the first three products of each category, do the shipping class then, because if, if, they're, if they're changing by category or changing by product, it's good to have them done then, because then you'll see why in one of my, my points about duplicating, dupli once you duplicate it, it's already done. You see what I mean? Like the, as far as the, yes. the shipping class and the stock, you know, if that's all the same for each category or each product, once you duplicate it, it's already done. You don't have to go back and do it again. Absolutely. Yeah. That we'll just dive into that one. Duplicating, you know, products based on their category. That way yeah, you don't have to redo every lot. little thing. The good thing yes. about WordPress too, particularly with WooCommerce is you can edit products in bulk. So you can select a number that's of true. products and then just go up and then edit the, the selections. And then you can edit certain details within that. So you can give them certain categories and stuff in bulk, which is really handy as well. Yes. Uh, we talked about optimizing images, uh, particularly before they go on the website. Um, yeah. uh, there was some basic stuff you mentioned just with site design for, you know, either saving code or, or um, doing, you know, responsive stuff for selections and rows that you know right. are going to be duplicated throughout the entire site. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I found that, um, like, for instance, just because, um, you know, naturally, I, I would do the the mobile design after I did the main design, but like for things, you know, you're going to duplicate like a header image, do the, you know, a header and header images, buttons, you know, things like that, that you know, you're going to duplicate on different pages, do the mobile design on those before you duplicate them. I waste of time. Yeah. So or or set them as that. global or UCSS to be able, that way you can customize it and it'll, yeah, it'll, yeah. it'll automatically respond responsive on, right, right, uh, right, on right. those other site pages. Yep. And that's just a good design principle for sure. Any, uh, anyway. We talked about the email deliver, uh, deliverability, a couple of just final points I thought was interesting that you listed out. Um, Google voice and whether they want to display a phone number for contact. What, um, yeah, yeah so what did that look like? I, the reason I put that in there is because basically before her, I did a site for my cousin. It was unofficial, but I did a site for my cousin and she was starting a business. And then this woman was starting a business with, with, with their websites with me. Right. And in that they both wanted to offer a phone number on their website, but they obviously didn't want to put their actual cell phone number on there. So I would just recommend for people, especially, you know, with, with, um, e-commerce, a lot of times for customer service, you do want to offer a phone number, but if you don't want to offer your actual cell phone number, I would recommend just having some type of trend, maybe like your client resources page, you know, having a little video of how to set up your Google voice number. And what I normally recommend, which is why I was saying make create a video of it is to put it on do not disturb that way. It, it straight takes them to a voicemail. That way you can get back to them when you want and they're not calling your phone whenever or whatever. That's you know good, what I mean? Yeah. So they can contact you. They can text you if they need to, but they don't get immediate access to you. And just having that as a resource for your clients to say, hey, if you want to you know, put your phone number on your website, use this and give them a little 
you know, tutorial, Google Voice is free. That's you know. beautiful. That's great. It's something I didn't really think about or have set up because that is one of the other big components to e-commerce is to let yeah. clients know there's a whole level of customer service here that most clients don't even think about. Like you exactly. are going to have to do the customer support moving forward, particularly if it grows and scales. So yeah, and we talked we talked about this when doing her her contact page. You know, we want the, okay, the yeah. information that she wanted on there. You know, we had her PO box on there, and she did mention her phone number being on there because she said she was going to be putting it on her business card and stuff. And I was like, you need to do Google Voice. You know, this is yeah. the internet. You don't want to be putting your cell phone number on the internet. So yeah. Beautiful. And then uh, another final thing you mentioned too, uh, a lot, pretty much there, you made some other points, but they were a lot of it was referencing what um, James and I talked about in episode 57 with collecting content. So I'll just refer. That was very helpful to, for me. Yeah. Just I'm so glad to, to hear that. that. Yeah, yeah. Just, yeah. you know, set, setting the constraints, how to contact you, how all that goes, having a, a clause in your contract if yes. there's a delay in collection. Uh, but the last thing you mentioned that I thought would be worthwhile to hit here before we before we end is uh, verifying a street address for Google My Business, which a lot of people, you know, if they're starting their website, it's something they don't think about, but right. uh, that's so, something that's important. Yeah, that I'm still actually working on that with her because, um, again, I mentioned she lives in the Virgin Islands. They deal with hurricanes. So the address that is her actual address for her business, that's not going to be shared on publicly but you can you know like you've taught us can be added into google google my mm -hmm. business without being shared publicly you they have to send a pin number physically to your address yeah. and because um of a hurricane she had temporarily relocated out of that address and oh. no one was checking the mail or whatever and i think a mailbox wasn't even up and to be able to take because a uh, hurricane sure wow so, i didn't even think about that well that got lost and even though the, it said they tell you that it's supposed to come in 14 days and that 14 days came and went and it never happened she said she had her brother checking it and it just never happened whatever and so now i'm going through the process of having them resend it because she said he he installed a, a, a mailbox and now that's happening so just to let them know ahead of time this is what's going to be needed if you're going to be setting them up for google my business to help with their seo yeah. And you know, this is exactly why I say for every project in your initial questionnaire, ask, have a, have a box that says, do you have Google My Business set up? Yes. Do you need help with that? Because if you need help with that, as you're finding out, it can be tricky depending on the situation. <laughs> the yours is definitely just like everything Isolated. else with this project, more yeah. tricky than <laughs> like most people's mailboxes aren't down right. from the hurricane, but, <laughs> right, right, uh, right. but it's definitely something that needs to be taken care of. So yeah, just uh, letting yeah. them know that, that they need to prepare for that. If that's what they want, you know, a lot of people want the Google my business without even knowing that it helps with the SEO. They just see other people have it and they want it. So just let them know in order for it to be verified they just need to be able to receive a pin number, look out for it, whatever, you know. Yeah. What I mean. And this whole episode is exactly why e-commerce projects should not be less than 5, 10, 15K, depending on the size of it. This was definitely probably, <laughs> probably a $7,500 one all in all. Um, you know, maybe dependent, maybe it could go down to five, but, uh, you know, at least at least you were able to up your pricing more than exactly. you thought you would because it, for both of you, it was a mindset shift. You, you know, like you couldn't imagine charging a few grand for a website, but then after this, it's like, oh my gosh, I only charged a few grand. Right. Should, have been, <laughs> should have been at least double. So, uh, right, but that's right. all right. Good, good learning experience. You made a client for life. She's continuing to pay you. She's on your maintenance plan. I just want to know, Alexis, how did it feel when this went live? I had some champagne. I will say that. <laughs> Good for you. Good for you. I did because it was just, it definitely felt like a huge accomplishment. And honestly, what felt the best was her response. You know, mm. getting through it and figuring out all of those hiccups and, and issues and tackling all of those things. But her response and how pleased she was with it just, you know, that that's what it's for. <laughs> that's what you're doing yeah. this for. You know what I'm saying? On, on top of obviously bringing your, your client success and results and stuff. But you know, it's just, it just is very rewarding, very rewarding to, I felt very accomplished. I couldn't believe that I actually got through a lot of that stuff, you know? So it just felt amazing. It did. 
That's awesome, Alexis. I'm so glad for you. I'm so proud of you for sticking it through some from challenging points. I know you had some highs and lows with this one, but you got through it and it yeah. was an awesome, you know, into a, a complicated build, but I'm so glad it worked out and I'm excited for you to continue to help you out moving forward because I know you got a lot of other big stuff on the horizon here. So yeah. thanks so much. Thanks so much for being transparent about your experience and sharing everything you learned on this one. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. But I would not have been able to do this without every ounce of your help the entire way. So thank you so much. I mean, from the guidance in the courses to the extra help in between, you know, with, with being able to ask you questions has just been incredibly valuable. So thank you for everything as well. Oh, that's awesome, Alexis. Well, I'm, I'm honored to help you out with your journey. And yeah, super pumped to, to see what you've done already. And 2021 is going to be your year. So I'm pumped for you. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me on here. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks for coming on, Alexis. And maybe we'll do this again sometime here. I'd love to. Awesome. Sure. Cheers. All right. Bye-bye. Hey guys and gals, just wanted to pop in with a couple things before you head out. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to this podcast. I would love to hear your feedback and it will also help other web designers find the show. Be sure to check out the show notes for this episode. Just go to joshhall.co, click on podcasts and search this episode number and you'll find all the links, descriptions and resources we talked about. And if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe and you'll be notified when the next episode is live. Thanks again for tuning in and I'll catch you guys on the next episode.